establishing order to the church. And we've been coming out of the book of 1 Corinthians. I've been talking to you about church ordinances. I hope this doesn't bore you because it shouldn't because this is about your life. You know that the church of Jesus Christ has been set forth by Jesus in the earth in order to bring benefit to your life. Jesus said he was going to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. You know, this is more than about a building. This is about an assembling of people together. And in that assembling of people together, there it is to enrich our lives and to bring blessing on our lives. You know, we're meant to be a blessing one to another. God gives you fabulous, wonderful, and miraculous faculties and gifts in order to be blessings one to another. But there has to be order to the facilitating of these things. And I'm not just talking about orders of structure, but I'm talking about orders for our lives. So we're moving forward here, and we've been studying 1 Corinthians, and we're, this is going to be part three, and this is going to cover sexual immorality. Amen. Y'all still with me now? Glory to God. I'm glad you are. So we're going forward this morning. If you'll find 1 Corinthians in your Bible. First Corinthians, I'm sure what I'm about to speak would touch some great nerves within the public uh, and within our society today, but nonetheless, let the gospel and the truth of the gospel be preached. Hallelujah. People say, you must be one of them old archaic people. You know, you need to, you need to catch up with the times. Well, I'm with the time because I'm with him that is beyond time and who was always is and always has been and always will be. Somehow we think that what we live in in this modern technological society is new. Well, you know, it's not. We're doing the same things that societies have done in the past. So let's move forward here this morning into the Word of God. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read uh, some of this to you. And if you don't get it all, you can go on Facebook and go to the Fire Christian Fellowship and access this message, or either through YouTube, or you can get a copy of it on CD if you need to, okay? So if you don't get all of this, that's fine. Go back and listen to it a second time. I hope sometime in the soon we can get this into iTunes uh, store. So let's go forward here. I'm going to be starting at 1 Corinthians 14, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14. Now, I don't have it up here on the screen, but I will when I get to chapter 5. So I'm looking here at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14. He says, I write not these things to shame you. Please pay attention to that. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. So we've got to see something out of the Apostle Paul's heart here that this is not to shame anybody, but he's bringing correction. We've been talking about out of this whole thing from 1 Corinthians that in the overview of this book that there are many corrections that have to be made within the church. We know that the church is not a perfect place because there's not perfect people inside of it. So let's go on into verse 15. He says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Look at what he just said again. Not only is Paul writing this letter, but he's going to send Timothy. He says, I've sent Timothy. And that he is going to bring you into remembrance of my ways. And basically what he teaches in every church. So let's go on verse 18. He says, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. And will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. I've got that highlighted in my 19. 
Not the speech, but the power. Look at verse 20. I've got this one highlighted, and I've got it underlined in blue, and then I've got it underlined again in red. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Hallelujah. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod? Or in love and in the spirit of meekness. Now, I'm going to begin bringing up here chapter 5, okay? So, if you're looking up here, this is a large portion of Scripture because I'm covering 1 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6. And I've highlighted several verses that we're going to mention, and that'll be chapter 6, verse 9, 13, and 18. So don't let all of this confuse you. I'm just start trying to get it all up there. I'm starting at chapter 5 here. It says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Make some marks here. Reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. There is a man within the Corinthian church who is having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. My God, we think that church is, oh Lord. Well, never mind. I'm going to move forward in this, and I'm going to cover this, because this is something that has to be covered. And I, you know, I know there's young people in here, but you know, the young people of this generation, they're being exposed to stuff. My Lord, what they know, I coach plenty of them, and I know what they talk about, and at young ages. So, you know, I understand that we have to uphold certain sanctities within the church, but uh, at the same time, they need to hear the truth that is in the Bible because the world ain't holding back nothing from them, okay? So, moving forward here, he says, And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Going on to verse 3, he says, For... I verily, as be as absent in body, but present spirit, have judged already. But don't be judging. Lord, have mercy. He says, I'm judging. You better have some judgment. If you, if you are a spiritual person, the Bible says a spiritual man judges all things. If you don't have any judgment, then you don't have the ability to make a decision. That's really what a, a decision is a judgment. So people say, don't be judging me. In other words, they're saying, don't make a decision. What, what am I supposed to be, a spineless uh, jellyfish? No, I am a I am a born again creature who has a a righteous God, and His righteousness brings into my life the ability to discern or judge what is good and what is evil, and that is done by the capacities of God's Word. What God has already revealed about Himself is held in the truth of the gospel. Going on, as though I were present concerning him that have done or so done this deed. Verse 4, he says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. People say, huh, deliver him to Satan, my God. That the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. And we'll teach you on that in just a few minutes. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Y'all know what leaven is, right? He says, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and of wickedness, but of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. I'm going to define all of this in just a minute, so hold on with me. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Pay attention to what he says in verse 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you need to go out of the world. I'll try to get this in the plain. This is King James, so I'll try to get it in the plainest way I can say it. In other words, when he said, when I wrote to you not to keep company with fornicators, he said, I wasn't talking about the people out in the world. I was talking about the people in the church. Because he said, if I was talking about the people in the world,
get in a, a rocket ship and go to Mars. Because that, that's what's going on out there. Y'all better understand what's going on in Corinth when he's writing this. I'll tell you in just a minute. But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man called a brother. Be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not you judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. I'm going to move on here. I'm going to pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus, what needs to be communicated, let that be communicated and nothing else. Lord, I set aside myself to you right now. Lord, to be reserved unto you. For what you want to communicate to the people in this place. Lord, every person that hears this, God through social media or Lord however avenue it comes to them I pray that it comes to them Lord in not in words but it comes to them in power and I'm praying for the power of conviction from the Holy Spirit to touch their heart that this is not my words but yours Lord what you have laid out for our lives I pray God that someone Lord whether in this place or some other foreign place from here that, God, that they would hear this as truth and they would receive it as truth. And, God, I thank you that truth instrumentally changes our lives. And I praise you for that. It's what sets us free because you said that he, oh, Lord, mm, that we would know the truth and the truth would make us free. And I praise you for that. So I'm going to move forward right here. I'm going back to chapter 4, verse 15. Paul says that you have 10,000 instructors. If you look this word up in, in the Greek of his original text, it literally reads a boy leader or someone who led you to school. But he says you don't have many fathers. If you had done an extensive study of what he just talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 he is talking about if you're still with me there you can back up because he's talking about he's talking about the calling of the apostles and how they were operating within the church he has said in verse 9 of chapter 4 he said that he said i think that god has set forth us the apostles last and it, it, as we were appointed to death we've been made a spectacle to the world and the angels and men we're fools for christ but you're wise we're weak but you're strong you are honorable but we're despised he says, even to this present hour, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and naked, and buffeted, and I have no certain dwelling place, a labor, working with my own hands, being reviled, I bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed. You know, being called to be an apostle ain't no easy thing. You know, you're not only going to have encounters with people, but the, the demonic principalities are at war with you as well. He says, look, you've got a whole lot of people that's trying to teach you things, but that ain't, the, that ain't what you need. You need some fathering in your life. We just talked to April, just uh, talked about this morning, that God is a good father. We have to have people within the body of Christ who are not just instructors to us and teachers to us, but people that are willing to be a father to us. And I know one thing that my Bible says, that if, if God is a father, then he is also one who will correct me and he will discipline me and he does it because he loves me. We have to have people in the body of Christ that we know and that we trust can be a father to us and who will correct us and confront us whenever there is something in our lives that maybe we don't see or maybe we just neglect to see or maybe we don't want to see. You know, there's things going on within the Corinthian church. They seem to be a very spiritual prop people, but Lord, the church is riddled with major problems. And we can see here that he is, begins talking to them about I'm not going, I'm not here to shame you. I'm here to warn you. So let's move forward in this. He says that they need a fathers to them. These are people who have an apostolic input into their lives. And they have a fathering spirit. If you don't know this, and I know many of you, I probably covered it enough for you to know it. The, 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 the role of the apostles within the church was to be a fathering spirit. What do I mean by that? Paul says that he had begotten them in the gospel. He also said this of Timothy 
he was his beloved son. Now this wasn't Timothy. Timothy wasn't Paul's natural son. He was his son in the faith. Paul also had said with many within the Corinthian church that many of the people within there that he had begotten them. That's vastly different than being born. What am I going to tell you about that for just a minute? I'm going to move quickly. To be begotten, you know, the Bible says that Jesus was God's only begotten son. I want you to think about that for just a minute. To be begotten, this is the role of a father. You know, a mother, she brings forth a child or the child is born. But a father has a role in this as well. And that role within this is to beget his children. And to be begotten of a father means that that father is going to take on a responsibility to raise you up. Fathers, you have a responsibility to raise your children up. What do I mean by that? You know, I, don't, I, I know that it takes a, a, I believe it takes a man and a woman. It takes a husband and a wife to raise a child. You know, the, the, the society out here today is telling you that it takes a village. It takes a community. I believe that's a lie. God created a man and a woman to raise their children in the capacity which they saw fit. That fitting is to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I take on a responsibility. I have five sons, and I have a lot of responsibility. I have taken on a responsibility to, to raise them. Yes, my, my wife birthed them, but it is my responsibility as a father to beget them. I take on that role. Fathers, you, gotta, you have a responsibility to take on, and to raise them up means that whatever is in them, I have to correct and I also have to love, I have to discipline, and I also have to encourage. I have to bring things, you know, my wife has a, a, a unique ability, and I believe that women have this capacity to bring things out in their children. You know, she, she can see things that, that is in them and things that, that also maybe need to be corrected. It is my job to take those things and bring them up. Wherever they are at, I'm, I'm supposed to bring them to a higher level. You know, I, I tell my children, I say, look, uh, I'm going to raise you not to be an impulsive creature, but to be an intelligent being. They can probably, they probably hear that in their mind. You know, so many people in this day, they live by their impulse. If you've never had a father, you will live by your impulse. What does that mean? That whatever you feel like doing. Whatever I feel like doing is what you live by. If you don't have a father, you will be impulsively driven. Whatever cravings of your flesh, whatever you desire, that's what you do. When you have a father, you do not operate off of your impulses. You know, if my children just, they do something and I say, why did you do that? I don't know. You did it because you were being impulsively led. And I'm now going to be impulsively led to correct you and you're not going to like the discipline aspect, but I am raising you up not to be led by those impulses, but now you're going to think before you do it again. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm raising them up to be an intelligent creature that thinks about consequence before action. Hello. You know, you've got to have a father in your life, and you have to have fathers in your life spiritually. Now, I'm not talking about taking the place of God my father. You know, people, there's, a, there's a people with a renegade spirit in the body of Christ today. They say, well, you know, God's my father. I answer to him. You know, there are people that we should have in our life that we do answer to, that we have accountability to. What Paul is pointing out here, I had wrote a long time ago at the top of chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians, accountability. There's no accountability in the church at Corinth. People are just doing whatever they want to. There's a leadership problem in the church of Corinth. And one of the main leadership problems is, is they don't want to confront the actions of the people. They don't want to upset the egg basket. You know, maybe that person, they might have been a big tither in the church. You know, a lot of, a lot of pastors, man, they back off from that. I'm not going to back off from that. If there's a problem in your life, it needs to be confronted. And Paul is telling them, if you don't confront this, it's going to cause a, the whole church is going to be messed up. I'm going forward here now. He says, I'm sending uh, one of my sons. You know, somebody who has been raised as a son, they understand how to become a father. Wow. You know, many of us did not have.
proper roles or, or have seen proper leadership of father. We may have seen, had, a, had an absent father or may not have known our father. We may have had all kind of different things. You know, in this society today, there's a, not a, a good image of what is a good father. So it just goes right back to what my wife was talking about. And try, many times I've seen people struggle with their relationship with God because in seeing him as a father, they see him through the eyes of their own father. And they, they don't know how to capture the image of a good father. The church has to become a, a model of fathering. So moving on here. He says that you're just puffed up. You are puffed up. What does that mean? It means that there's been growth in their life, but it's just a, it's, they're just blowing up. They're inflating. They're proud. They're, they're, they have leaven. And they've been feeding, you know, leaven, if you don't, if you don't know this, when you make bread and dough, you, you, you put yeast in there and it starts feeding on the sugar. See, there's a, there is a, there's a certain uh, capacity within today's church to just feed God's people things that are sugary sweet. Thank you. I'm glad you agree with me. We got to, you know, we, we feed people, you know, you know all of, the, of the, the grace messages and everything that's so sweet and lovely. But you won't hear people confronting the problems and issues that we're facing. We have, if you don't do this, the churches, it, it'll blow up. It'll grow. We've got mega churches. We've got huge, but we're not making an impact on the society. This tells me uh, that there is a problem. This is what's happening in the Corinthian church. This church is very spiritual seemingly. He says in, in chapter 1 that they didn't come behind in any gift. These people are very gifted spiritual people. But then he goes on and says, you're babes because you're carnal. This tells me that there has been a lack within the leadership. You know, Paul had turned that church over to people who were to lead it, but that some of those leaders were not willing to confront what was going on. So going forward here, an apostolic father does not look, he looks not at words, but at power. We've got to grab a hold of that. You know, there's a lot of people that can talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And we've seen enough of that. I've seen enough of it in my own life. I don't, I don't want any more of that. I don't want it in my own life. I want to walk the gospel. I don't want to just talk about it. You know, it's a, we, are, we are so ridiculed in the world by, uh, and been called hypocrites and blah, 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 blah. You know, I've had a guy tell me I was working with him. He said, I'm not going to church, man. That's just a place full of hypocrites. I said, well, you should just come and join us because you'd fit right in. The world tries to act like they're not hypocrites. My God, come on. I'm not trying to say that the church is full of hypocrites. There are, there are some. And the word hypocrite means that you're a stage actor. I'm not up here acting. You know, I, got, I could be doing a thousand other things. And if somebody thinks, well, you just did it. You know, I've had people say, well, you just did it for the money. If I was in the ministry for money, I would have got out about, mm, about 13 years ago. It sure wasn't about that. You know, that's what Paul said. He said, I'm out here working with my own hands. You know, I'm, I'm trying to support myself. He's just trying to support himself. Hey, I'm trying to support myself, a wife and five kids. I'm not in this for that, my God. I want to walk with Christ. I want to follow Jesus. And I want the power of God to be evident in my life. I don't want to just be talking about things. My Lord, let's go on. So he says, I'm going to point out a, a thing here that the kingdom power is seen by what is under your foot. So I've been covering that lately. And I'm going to reiterate it again to you. What do I mean by that? He tells them that the kingdom of God is not in word or in speech, but it's in power. Whenever the kingdom of God is in force, please stay with me for just a moment. Whenever the kingdom of God is in force in believers' lives, it is evident by what is under their feet. I'm not talking about Nikes. And I'm not talking about the carpet. We can talk the gospel, preach the gospel, and prophesy, but if darkness, wickedness, sin, and our enemies are never put under our feet, we are only puffed up. And this is what Paul is communicating to them. You know, you, are, you seem like y'all are some spiritual people, but the demons are running amok among you. And they just, you doing whatever they tell you to do. He says, look, you got a guy in the church that's having a relationship.
stepmother, and you haven't done anything about this. Do you think that this is going, I mean, what do you all think this is going to turn into? Well, let's go forward then. The power of the gospel is to put darkness underfoot. Amen. Now, Paul begins laying out here that fornication, and I'll bring that up in just a minute, fornication is something that is common among them. He says it's sexual immorality. It can be interpreted either way. Your Bible may say sexual immorality if you've got a, a New King James or something else. What Paul is saying is that this has to be dealt with within the church. You know, we live in a society today that, you know, it's, it's free love, free sex, whatever. I mean, we, just, we think that we should just be able to do whatever we want to. Some people think that, well, Todd, you're just, you're just one of those archaic people, stone, stone age people that, that believes that, you know, you should try to put a stop to all this. No, listen, the Bible has laid out an order by which people can live and which is the best and optimal for their lives. Here's the thing. My wife was having a discussion, she told me, with one of her uh, college professors recently. And he said, so you don't believe in ordain ordaining uh, homosexuals into the ministry. She said, she looked at him and said, the college professor, and said, if you don't hold to the tenets of the Bible, then follow, find another religion. Why is it that we want to take particular parts of the Bible and cut it out. You know, you can't do that. If you're going to accept this and receive this as the truth, you've got to accept and receive the whole sum of it. Now, some people will say, you know, well, you don't understand everything that's within it, and, and should we still stone people? I am not trying to cover that today. I'm covering one thing, and it is sexual immorality. We'll get to the rest later, okay? So going forward here, we talked about last week, I'm reiterating this, we talked about what was the first order of the church. And this is the first order of the church that Paul began to cover is that we have to have unity and oneness. We have to combat divisions, contentions, and any separations that are among us. The second thing that he begins to pull up here is that the church must be holy, walk in sanctification, and must seek after purity. I'm talking about purity of life, purity of mind, purity of thought, purity of word, purity in relationships. So he moves into talking about fornication. What a perfect place to enter. Just bust the door in and go right on in on this situation. So this thing that he is talking about as far as fornication, it is sexual immorality. It can be also defined as debauchery, incest, perversions, adultery, any sex outside of a marital covenant, homosexuality, and the word here that appears in Greek is the word porneia, by which we get the word Pornography. So any place that you see in your New Testament, if you see the word fornication, you will know that this word is porneia. Okay, we get a lot of English words from Greek, Latin, so on and so forth. But this is where we get the word pornography. Okay, that word pornography or porneia includes all of these. All right, it's a broader spectrum word if you want to say it in another way. It covers anything that is considered any sexual activity that is outside the bonds of marriage, including and not excluding any of these. Okay, everybody good? You all with me? All right, good. So, an unwillingness to confront the conduct of believers will result in the church puffing up. There, there can be growth. This is a major this is a major issue right now within the church of Jesus Christ. We have, within the church, we are taking on positions that are contrary to the scripture. Not in this church. Many churches of today are taking on positions, let me say that again, that are contrary to the scripture. In order to be inclusive, or what we might call politically correct, or whatever way the society is going, that we're supposed to just have love and acceptance for everybody. I want, to know you, I want you to notice that Paul's speech is completely contrary to the way that most churches today are going. He says, why haven't you gotten rid of this guy? Man, we don't see that action. The preachers of the, Here's the problem. Many preachers...
they, they are begging people. I mean, we're doing everything we can to get people to come to church. Let me get a billboard, a TV ad, a radio spot, you know, whatever. They're trying to get notoriety, fame, whatever. I believe that we have completely missed the mark in trying to formulate the church after a business model which is marketing to try to get people to come to something that they, that they would like or enjoy. The, the church of Jesus Christ is not an institution of men. It is an establishment of the kingdom of God. And it is the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. The church is to look like heaven on earth earth there ain't no fornication happening in heaven and God did not create you to live in such a manner Paul goes on and tells them he says meat is for your belly but your body is for the Lord it is not for fornication going on he says he talks about began removing people from the fellowship folks this is serious business this is when my Lord, you know, a lot of people, they think, what, what in the world am I supposed to do here? Listen, just hold on just a minute. I'm telling you today that any lifestyle of, that would be considered under the guise of fornication, that you must, if you are a follower of Jesus, you must repent of any of these lifestyles. Some people say, well, you know, like people are saying, well, I, I was born homosexual. Well, you, you could claim the same thing under incest. You wasn't born to do that. You were, you were made by God to worship him. You were made by God in his image and his likeness, and you were, you were made to worship God. Your whole life is to, be sur you're, you're to surround yourself around him. Not around your sexual identity. Now we have people that are they're trying to self-identify. I'm, I'm a man in a woman's body. No, you're not. God is not a liar. He created you just like you are. You are confused. I've had, I, I'm not afraid to address this because I've had this conversation with many homosexual people. They are confused. Now listen. I know that there could be people in this room. I, you know, I'm not talking to some foreign crowd. There could be people who have been engaged in all types of, of activities of such. Let me say this to you. I have found in my own studies and in my own counseling with people, I've counseled many people on different sexual problems and so on and so forth. I ain't even going to get into all of that. I have found that most of the people that are living under these powers that many of them, it has been due to molestation that happened early in their childhood. You know, I preached a message of, in, back in 2007 on what was, it was called, What's Wrong With Being Gay? In that, I talked about, you know, and that, this has just permeated our society. It just goes through the speech. I mean, it's everywhere. That's all that people are talking about. All people talk about now is sex. My Lord, now you come to church and you're going to hear about it too. Well, it's about time. It's about time that somebody in the church started talking about it. And if we began presenting this properly, and if Christian people had an, you know, enough sense to be able to talk to people that are in these lifestyles, because I'm going to be honest with you, for the most part, people who are living a homosexual lifestyle, they are turned off by Christianity. They, are, they, they, they feel that Christians are hateful. You know, if you get down in this and begin to talk with them about it, you begin to discover a whole lot of things. And I, I, if you just listen, I can start picking up on things. And I'm like, mm-hmm, that, that happened in her life? Yep, uh-huh, okay. You start fitting the pieces together because really what has happened, these people are very broken people. They're hurting. You know, I know that some of them are demonstrative and they, they uh, you know, they're just belligerent about it. Not all of them are like this. There are many people that hate their lifestyle. You know why I know this? Because it is an addiction. Even though it's a perversion, it is an addiction. I understand addiction. I was addicted to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. I hated those things. They were fun at first. But just like anything.
Ashley, the time of fun runs out. It runs out. And they began to hate it. Going on here. I'm not just in here to just beat up on anybody or nothing like that. So the church has to make clear what is acceptable and unacceptable. And Paul is talking to them that you cannot be engaged in these relationships. People will say, well, this just seems bizarre, doesn't it? If, if we understand what is going on in Corinth, the mindset of this city, you know, sometimes we think that, that we're, we're new, we're cutting edge. Let me tell you about the city of Corinth. You can do your own research and study in this. This city has, is the main center for the temple of Aphrodite, okay? She is a Greek god or goddess, and she is the Greek goddess of sex and love. This is the god that the people of Corinth, the Greeks there, they worshipped. <laughs> so now you can start seeing what their mind is like. Their mind, the city is completely filled with uh, all kind of sexual immorality. Homosexuality, prostitution, this is, this is commonplace. The, the temple of Aphrodite, I read this out of uh, some Greek uh, history books that the temple of Aphrodite had at least a thousand sex slaves. Now you want to take a look at the city now. It didn't look like Lancaster, did it? Uh, no, this is a city that is wholly given over into sexual immorality. Now you've got to figure that the people that are in the, the church at Corinth, you know, these people have come out of lifestyles of being Greeks. There were Romans. We read that. There were Jews in the church. So, I mean, there are people with all kind of different concepts of life. And they've accepted Christ. And the church has to tell them what is acceptable before God. They've already done this. If you were to find the book of Acts chapter 15, you know, there were people going about in different churches telling Christian people, well, you need to keep the law and you, you need to be circumcised. And the, the apostles got together and they said, what is it that we need to communicate to the New Testament church? They came to the conclusion of two things. Keep yourselves from fornication and do not eat things sacrificed to idols. That was two major things. These two things have the potential to completely destroy the church. If you do not, if they go unchecked, they will, they will destroy the church. Don't y'all remember that this is what Balaam did? He was a prophet and they were trying to get him to curse the people of God. You ever read this before out of Numbers? It's also in the book of Jude. He said, I cannot curse what God has blessed. He was receiving money from the king in order to bring a curse on God's people. Well, he showed the king how you get God's people cursed. He said, send your daughters in there. They got, them, they got the men involved with heathen women and relationships with unbelievers. All of this is brought forth in Scripture that you are not to yoke yourself with an unbeliever. Going on. This, con this is a continued problem that is themed throughout uh, the book of, of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. It's leaders and their unwillingness to confront the problems. The church has to be purged of immorality. Let that sink in for just a minute. I'm not up here to expose you. I don't know what you're doing. I don't have a clue. But the church has to make a stand about what it is. And what it is is to be a light of truth in the world, in a dark world, in a society that is crooked and perverse, we are to stand. We are not to falter here. We are not to say, well, you know, these two people are shacking up and they're not married and they live together and we just, well, maybe they'll get married. No, the church has to say, look, you can't keep doing that. The church has to say that. We have to tell people the truth because if we're not willing to tell them the truth, we just, we just talk in words.
being allowed to go on is darkness is being allowed to continue in people's lives. If we're the light, we don't allow darkness to continue. If that person wants to continue in darkness, then they make that choice. You know, somebody can say, well, well, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. You know, sometimes that seems, sometimes it may seem that we can present ourselves in a critical manner. I'm not trying to criticize anybody in the world. I don't want to see people die and go to hell. If they want to, then that's their choice. But I'm not going to sit by silently and just watch. I'm not going to do that. You know, if you saw somebody driving off of a cliff, would you just sit and watch? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, hey, dude, danger ahead. You know, well, who are you? Why are you judging me? I'm not judging you. I'm judging the cliff. You're going to fall off the cliff if you keep going. I've already judged the cliff. <laughs> My Lord. So fornication is a work of the flesh. You can find that in uh, Galatians 5 and 19. Godly character, moral conduct, spiritual sanctification, and the fruit of a divine nature supersede any spiritual gifts or graces that are going on in your life. You know, I don't ever want this church to be confused about this. You know, we may put an emphasis on spiritual gifts. We may put an emphasis on prophecy, tongues, miracles, healing, whatever it is. But none of those things supersede you living a godly life. None of this supersedes you living in holiness and purity. Those things are first. If the church begins to emphasize the latter rather than the former, then we will wind up in problems. So anybody who's called, if you call to ministry, whatever, I don't, it doesn't matter what you call to, that has to be preceded by living holy. Has to be. That's what you need to focus on. You know, if somebody comes to me and they say, Todd, I feel like I'm called to the ministry. We don't need to focus on that. You need to focus on living a holy life first and foremost. Let's get that going first in our lives. And that's not something that we can neglect either. So lastly here, and I wanted to cover so much more, but I didn't. Paul says that this guy needs to be delivered to Satan. I'm going to end it with this today. Man, this seems like, I mean, this seems like something just bizarre. How in the world is the church now, this, this can seem crazy now, how is the church leading people to Christ and then he's talking about turning somebody over to Satan? Listen to me real closely. Whew. This isn't something that is lightly entered into and I do not want the church to ever think you know, well, you know, let's just turn them over to the devil. Listen, one of our uh, tenets by which we hold to is to hold people before God in prayer. We pray for people. We pray for their sanctification. We pray for people's salvation. We pray for people to live godly. We pray for people uh, that they be overcomers from the things that they are dealing with and struggling with. Paul is telling the church here in Corinth, if this guy is unwilling to repent of this lifestyle, you know, you've got to give people time and space. If he is unwilling to repent, then there's only one option that you have. Turn him over to Satan. Now, this isn't something that the church operates in all the time. And this isn't something that we should be doing all the time. This has to be, there has been a confrontation of this gentleman, and obviously the stepmother too, and within the church, I don't know whether the, 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 the guy's father even knows. Nobody, I don't know. Maybe he does. Who knows what the situation is? Paul doesn't lay out the whole, it's a, just a tangled up mess. If these people are not willing to repent, you turn them over to the devil. How do you do that? I've only had this happen twice in 22 years. 
There are people that I pray for. And I mean, I know, listen, I know intimate details of people's lives. They tell you things. I pray for these people. People confess sin. You know, I'm sure other people, they might do that in your life. That's not something that you go out heralding and talking about. That's something that you keep confidential. Paul has understood that this has gone beyond all of that within the Corinth church and that everybody in the church knows about it. Everybody. And it's not just them. He says it's, it's common with all of you. He says in the instance of this guy, if the, when he is confronted about this to drop this lifestyle, if he will not drop it, then there's got to be a correction that happens. This correction, I know I'm, it feels like I'm going over this again. Here is what I have had God tell me to do. Stop praying for them. Now this can seem confusing. I'm not encouraging you to do that. Because there are people that I hold in prayer. And I mean fast and pray for them. One morning I was fasting and praying for somebody. I had been, been praying and praying and praying. And I heard while I was praying, stop praying for them. And I was like, mm, God wouldn't tell me to do that. I kept praying. And the Lord said, stop praying. I said, no, that ain't God. That's got to be the devil. Third time, I went back praying for this person again. And I heard, stop praying for them in a bolder voice. Now, I done rebuked the devil, bound him. I, I said, God, if this is you, then you're going to have to explain to me why I need to stop praying for this person. And he said to me, I'm going to make them sick of their sin. I've had this happen twice to me in 22 years. There was a, someone I was praying for, uh, and some of you guys probably remember this when it happened. We were meeting early on Friday mornings and praying. I was laying in the floor back there. I was praying and crying out to God over somebody, and I heard the Lord say to me, do not pray for that person again. You know, I wanted to know, is this scriptural? And it absolutely is. From the book of Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah, do not pray unto me for this people. Do not intercede for them any longer. And this was not a fact that they were that God was not willing to hear the prayer. It was that another course of action was going to have to be taken. And Paul says that the reason that this has to be taken, he says this guy's flesh is going to be destroyed that his spirit might be saved. This is when, listen, this is, I wrote this up here. Oh, Lord, I didn't. Well, where did it go? I must not have included it. Intercession. I'm going to throw this in here as a bonus. The word intercede or intercession means that you cover something or lay over something in order for a judgment to pass or to stay. Okay? To stay a judgment. In other words, when you are praying for people, listen to this is how valuable your prayers and the prayers of the church and the prayers of, of spiritual leaders in your life are, is that when I'm praying for someone, can I borrow you, Jim? I'm covering him. I wish I had something I could do. We got that thing, Jim, we used last time we were up here, didn't we? You know, when somebody's living in a lifestyle that may not be right or proper or holy, God allows us as intercessors to pray. And that means when I'm praying for that person, I've got them covered. Look, now we talked about coverings. In other words, there, there can't be a judgment because he's not being seen. I'm standing in the way. Do y'all remember when God had said to Moses, he says, the people, whew, 
They rose up to eat, to drink, and to play. God said to Moses, get out of my way that I may destroy them and make a great nation out of you. And what did Moses do? Moses, think about this. He's standing in the face of God and he said, no. That is a portrait of intercession and a portrait of interceding in prayer. Let me tell you, when you are an intercessor, you are causing judgments to pass over. If we understand how valuable our prayers are, do you realize a lot of things are being thwarted from people's lives? When the church then begins to extract its prayers from over a person, it is making way for Satan to come in. Do you realize that if you're not praying for people, that you're making way for Satan to come into their lives and destroy them? I hope this makes sense to you. Satan is set on the destruction of men, women, children, and families. He is set on destruction. We have the ability by prayer to keep this destruction from happening in people's lives, even if they're living in sin. A lot's been invested in you as a believer. God has invested great power in you. Do you know that if there would not have been people praying for me, do you know where I would be? I'd be in hell. I believe that. My dear mother over here had, I don't know how many people praying for me. Those prayers were, Lord have mercy, they were bombarding heaven unto the extent by which the Holy Spirit is chasing me. I know that because I was at parties, lewd parties, wild places, and the Holy Spirit is all on me about the way I'm living the actions that I'm carrying out. And I'm, I'm, an, I'm drunk at parties and I'm saying, you're killing my buzz. Get away from me. And my friends are like, who are you talking to? I'm under a table telling, saying, get away from me. They lift up the tablecloth. They're like, who are you talking to? I'm talking to God. I'm telling him to go away. Get away from me. I'm trying to sin here. I can't sin with you around because I'm convicted. God is manifesting himself in my life. It don't matter what substance are you own. When God begins manifesting himself, he's drawing you to life and you want to stay in death. Can you imagine if the prayers would have immediately stopped? What would happen? I was this close to eternity. I'm hearing the voice of God waking me up in the middle of night saying, if you die right now, where are you going? Do you realize that when you begin praying for people, God is pursuing people? You know, I don't know who you may know that's out here living in sexual immorality, but they need your prayer. They really need prayer. They really need your prayer. Because if they die in that, you can read 1 Corinthians 6. He says that no fornicator will inherit the kingdom of God. Not a single one. They need your prayer. They need you to pray for them. I'm going to end with prayer. And if you know somebody that you, need, that you know that needs prayer concerning this, Please pray for them right now. You don't have to pray for them out loud. You can pray for them under your breath. They don't need to be exposed in front of other people. Maybe it's you. I don't know. Maybe you need prayer. This is a beautiful time for you to repent of that. Maybe you've been in the bondages of pornography. 
It's rampant in the society. This is not something, 90% of men in America regularly view pornography. 90%. Women, you're not absent from that. 46% of women in America. Father, I pray for the power of deliverance from sexual immorality. God, that seems to be so pervasive in this society. Lord, the society seems like and acts like that it's, it's free, but it's actually in bondage. They can't escape the lust of their own flesh. But God, you have called us to live above the lust of the flesh. You have called us to walk in the Spirit. And you said you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For you said that the lust of the flesh, it is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit to the flesh. God, your word says that the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. Those are the first two things listed. God, we need freedom in this day. I pray not only for the church and for the Christians in this place, but God, for the churches in this community, in the church of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, for a deliverance to come. Lord, let it start here. God, let it be an outgrowth to other churches and communities. God, a deliverance from sexual immorality, from fornication, adultery, homosexuality, things that are happening, God, in people's lives, things that are happening secretly. I'm praying for deliverance. I'm praying for deliverance from pornography. I'm praying for deliverance, God, from, from Lord, even children, God, that may be within the church that are being molested. God, whether it's at home or whether it's happening at church, God, I'm praying for deliverance. Wherever these things are happening, Father, we, we implore you, we beseech you, God, Lord, that you might move. Lord, if there's someone in this room that needs deliverance, we pray, God, for every person, Lord, every person that's under the sound of my voice, God, whether they are in this building or they hear this some other way, I pray, God, for instantaneous deliverance to happen now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the power of the kingdom, Lord, let it rule over darkness. In the name of Jesus, God, that it's not just be words and speech, but, Lord, that freedom come to people's lives. The Lord, that they're not captured and captivated, God, by these works of the flesh and by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. God, in the name of Jesus, send deliverance. Send deliverance, God. And I thank you for it. Lord, if there's someone in this room, God, that knows another person that needs deliverance, Lord, I pray that you put it in their heart to pray for that person, to hold them up before you in prayer. And I praise you for that. God, I pray, Lord, as we leave out of this place.